Welcome to the presentation, Fifth Grade Measurement. Uh, this presentation focuses on the fifth grade thor third quarter standards related to measurement. The slides in this presentation will automatically progress. If you want to pause at any point, just press the up arrow on your laptop or computer. And then when you're ready to start the slideshow again, you can press the down arrow. The expected outcomes for this presentation are to use um, content from the unpacking document to really dig into these standards and what they're asking us to do. Uh, then we're going to look at some teaching strategies for measurement and data concepts. And then also we're going to look at fraction concepts. I wanted to really have some time to discuss how we can build fractions into everything that we do related to measurement in fifth grade. Uh, and then like I said, uh, lastly we're going to look at how to integrate those fraction concepts into these standards. So right off the bat, before we go into measurement, I wanted to review some fractions concepts. Um, the reason for this is so that when we talk about the measurement standards, we can be thinking about how we can build these fractions concepts into the measurement standards. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to discuss is how to multiply fractions at the fifth grade level. There's two types of situations um, in which students multiply fractions. The first is when they're multiplying a whole number and a fraction. Uh, there's two ways of looking at multiplying a whole number by a, and a fraction. The first is where students can describe the situation using groups of, like four groups of three-fourths, and they can solve these types of problems using repeated addition. Let me show you an example of this. So that's four bottles of soda. Each bottle is three-fourths full. Um, and again, this you could be solved using repeated addition, four groups of three-four sorry, four groups of three-fourths, and then they could repeatedly add three-fourths four times, or you could say four times three-fourths. There's another type of multiplying whole number and fraction problem that we would see at the fifth grade level. And that type of problem or situation, uh, you could use the term of or the word of to describe that situation. Uh, and this just is a little bit different than what we just saw with the repeated addition. Uh, here, an example of this is you're looking at a fraction of a whole number. So three-tenths of a whole number. Um, to solve problems like this, you would find one part of that whole number and then find that fraction that you're looking for. Uh, let me, hopefully this makes sense in the example here. So if I had three-tenths of 120 pencils, first I would figure out, okay, well I know one-tenth of 120 is 12, so 3 tenths of 120 is 36. Uh, so this is just a little bit different than that repeated addition because in the repeated addition we're repeatedly adding um, because we have groups of fractions. Here we're looking at a part of a whole number. So it's just a little bit different conceptually. The way that students engage with multiplying fractions at the fifth grade level is multiplying a fraction by a fraction. So here we can think of uh, thinking of parts of a part, uh, because with fractions, of course, you wouldn't have a whole group, so you wouldn't be able to say groups of. You would now be looking at parts of a part. Um, the other way that we could multiply fractions at the, fifth, at the fifth grade level is by thinking of area. So here, instead of saying a three by four space, we would say a three fourth by five eighths space, for example. Let me give you some examples of problems that we would do um, with these concepts. So, thinking about part of a part, you could be thinking of this situation. One half of the class is boys, one fourth of the boys wore glasses. So you're thinking about part of part of that class. So that would be um, one half of one fourth, or actually this should be one fourth of one half, um, or one fourth times one half. The other way that we could think about this is by thinking, like I said, with area. Um, so a farm that is one half of a mile long by one fourth of a mile wide. And again, you can use multiplication to solve problems like that. So that's what we have with Let's move into division. There are also two types of division problems that students would uh, be exposed to at the fifth grade level. The first is partitive division, where that's where we know the number of parts that we're dividing a quantity into. Um, and to solve problems like this, you can do fair shares. You know the number of parts, you just don't know how much goes in each part or how big an area or space or measure goes into each part. Let me show you an example of a problem like this. So we have one-fourth of a cake, and we're going to break it into four parts. So again, we know that there will be four parts, we just don't know the size of the parts. 
So that could be solved by 1 fourth divided by 4. It's really important to note that at the fifth grade level, the only time we will um, have, we will, the only numbers we will be using related to division of fractions, um, one of the numbers will always be a unit fraction with one as the numerator. The other number will always be a whole number. So here you see a unit fraction divided by a whole number. At the sixth grade level, then the students will start to see other quantities. But at fifth grade, it's always just one unit fraction, one whole number. So again, partitive division is where we know the number of parts, and we need to make fair shares to figure out how big those parts are. The type of division that we will experience at the fifth grade level is measurement division. Um, here we know the measure or the size of the parts. We just don't know how many parts we can make. Um, and this is just that repeated subtraction, kind of like we would do with whole number division. Uh, so an example of this is there's four cakes at a party. Each person gets one-fourth of a cake. So you're going to repeatedly subtract one-fourth of a whole from four and see how many times you can do that. And then you would know your number of parts or your number of times you can do that. So let me just repeat this. So partitive division is where you know the number of parts and you're going to make fair shares to find the measure. Measurement division is where you know the size or the measure of the parts, but you don't know how many times you can take away that part so you would be using repeated subtraction. Just a brief overview of division of fractions and multiplication of fractions, and now we're going to get into our measurement and data standards. There's two parts up to the third quarter related to measurement and data. The first part we're looking at right here on our screen, um, it's weeks four through six, and here the students have two standards. The first one is those measurement conversions, and then the second part of this section is making line plots. Um, by taking measurement data and plotting it onto a line plot. Uh, that, that standard's a bit tricky. People have a lot of questions about that one. We're going to start by talking about conversions, and then we will go ahead and move into line plots. Before we jump into uh, looking at those measurement standards, I really just wanted to focus on this chart just for a second um, to draw attention to a couple things. Uh, the state has identified three major areas of fifth grade math, um, which are numbers and operations. And actually, that's that could be considered two areas because that includes place value and number operations. Um, then the second major area is fractions. And the third major area is volume. Uh, please note that volume is the only major work of the grade that's related to measurement. So the standards that we're going to start off talking about, those measurement conversions, that measurement conversion standard, and then that line plot standard, they are not major areas of the grade. Uh, and since DPI takes this heavily into consideration when determining those EOG items, chances are that most of this 10 to 15 percent of the test here will be on volume. Um, to prove that point, I went on to the released EOG items and I looked at the release test. Over half of the questions from the measurement and data section were on volume. There was only one item for measurement conversions. There was one item related to line plots and then there was one other item. I can't really remember what that one um, addressed. So my biggest suggestion when looking at this is this is a great time in this measurement section to figure out ways to embed place value, to embed um, operating on numbers, and to embed those fractions concepts. In fact, when I was looking at the release test, that's exactly what they what DPI did in those released items. Let's go ahead and just take a look at one quick example of released items. Uh, so this is actually a measurement conversions item. This was the only measurement conversion item on the fifth grade released EOG. And you'll notice that at first glance, you would might think that it was actually a fractions uh, item. And the problem just asks, Jennifer needs to buy nuts. She has enough money to buy 20 ounces. She puts one and a half pounds of nuts into a bag. How many ounces does she need to remove to have 20 ounces in the bag? So you're doing a little bit with fractions, but you're also working with conversions. We'll talk about some ways to build fractions into these standards a little bit later. But let's go ahead and get into our first standard, which is the measurement conversion. 
I wanted to start out by looking at 4MD1 from fourth grade because they also have a standard related to measurement conversions. Uh, their standard, though, looks at if you have a larger unit, what is that in terms of the smaller unit? So it's almost like if you have, uh, let me give you an example, if you have uh, one foot, you know that that's 12 times as long as one inch. And if you have a four foot snake, that could be 48 inches. Uh, the big thing that students at the fourth grade level are doing is when they make these conversions, they're making tables and using the patterns that they're noticing in the tables to figure out those conversions. So they're not directly um, memorizing a procedure to convert, but they're looking for those patterns to help them convert. The units that they're converting are both metric and customary. The nice thing about this is those are the exact same units that you will be doing at the fifth grade level. Let's take a look at 5MD1. So 5MD1 states that you're going to convert among different sized standard measurement units within a single system. So that means metric to metric and then customary to customary. The next part of the standard is you're also going to solve multi-step real-world problems. So this standard, is a, that's a great time to focus on those number operations because you might multiply, divide, add, subtract. Um, it's also a great time to focus on place value concepts because we will be converting um, between those metric units. And then it's also a nice time to focus on fractions as you are hitting those customary units. And again, we'll talk about how we can do this a little bit later on. A couple things to consider when teaching this conversions uh, standard. You really want to begin your unit by reminding students that there are two different systems of measure. Uh, students tend to forget that. Uh, you might also want to start by beginning your unit giving students an attribute and seeing how many different units they can brainstorm to measure that attribute. And then you would like to probably start this unit also by having partners sort cards containing metric and customer units so they can um, discern the difference between the metric and the customary. Something else to consider, uh, students typically confuse the terms attribute and unit, so you really want to spend some time addressing this, this confusion. Uh, we want to remind students that attributes are characteristics that we can measure. So example, length is an attribute, width, volume, and weight are all attributes. And then units are what we're actually using to measure those attributes. You're going to want to discuss this idea with the students. Um, so what you could do is name an attribute and have students brainstorm all the different units that you could, be, you could use to measure that attribute. Some more things to consider. The bigger the unit, the less we need, and the smaller the numbers. And I think all teachers pretty much realize that students have a really hard time with this concept. If your students are having a hard time with this concept, one thing that you can do is um, talk about baby steps versus big steps and predict how many baby steps it would take to cross the room versus how many big steps. You could also talk about and model uh, using big versus large or small versus large paper clips to measure a desk or an object at your desk. And then my favorite um, activity to do to kind of address this misconception is to read Super Sandcastle Saturday by Stuart J. Murphy. Uh, I wanted to just highlight one or two activities from the Cumberland County Schools Resource Guide. This is on the CNI Google site. Uh, so this first activity is from Illuminations. It's um, the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics website, and you, you can click on the link below to find it. So you would start off your unit by having groups of students or partners of students brainstorm all the units that we use in the metric system. And then they would write each of those units on a separate index card. After they have all of their index cards for just the metric system, they're going to organize their cards into categories of weight, length, and volume. Then, once they're organized into those three categories, then the students would order, order each category from smallest to largest, and that might look like this. The last part of this is then the groups or partners would take a different color and then record something that could be measured using each of those units. And here it's not a different color, but hopefully you get the idea. Another neat activity um, that I found was on the CCS resource guide again, and it's on Math Playground. It's just a really quick video that you can show students 
explaining the metric system, but it also focuses really heavily on the place value um, concepts that we worked on at the beginning of the school year and um, decimal concepts. So I thought that was just a really good activity to highlight. Um, these are just a couple posters that I wanted to quickly touch upon. Uh, I, I've seen these in most classrooms. So this is one way that you can help students see the difference between the size of the units. Uh, this also helps students see that the bigger the unit, the less it takes um, to, to build or measure something. So a milliliter or millimeter, for example, is really small. So you would need a lot of those stacked upon each other um, to get to the size of a kilometer, kilometer or kilometer. I wanted to show you another strategy for doing measurement conversions, especially for the metric conversions. Um, it is going to feel like I'm going off on a tangent for a second, but it really will lead into a point. Uh, so I was watching a TED video um, by Val Faulkner the other day. She teaches math at um, NC State pre-service teachers, and she was talking about the fact that kids have a really hard, st hard time understanding the magnitude or the quantity, the size of numbers. And it's a lot of times because we're just showing them you're shifting a decimal or you're, you're or, um, a digit is moving from place to place, but they don't really feel that size of what it means. Um, she said one of the reasons that we really still focus on telling time on analog clocks is because as that time elapses on an analog clock, we could really see it and feel it um, as students. Versus if you're just looking at a digital clock, it doesn't have that, that feeling of time spanning. Let me show you an example of what that means. So here we have a, a sample of what a clock looks like or almost what a round number line looks like. And each time we um, elapse an hour by the hand spinning around on the clock, we see that there is an hour elapse. We feel that time going on. Um, so for each circle, circle that we complete, that's another hour elapsed. So five of these hours, let me get to five, so here, five hours have now elapsed. So kids can actually feel that there's a difference between the five in the five hours that just elapsed versus that five in the five minute mark. Um, you, you really want them to feel what this means. She was an EC teacher um, and her students with exceptionalities uh, grew exponentially because they could actually feel the magnitude or the quantity, the size of these numbers. Now let me show you what we could do um, on this kind of idea, but looking at the metric system. So again, this is just if students need an activity to be able to feel what's happening or understand what's happening uh, as we move from centimeters to decimeters to meters. So you might start off giving students a game board that looks like this, have them roll a die and have them move their piece starting at zero, move their game piece around the full circle. Each time they complete a full circle, they'll have earned a decimeter. Uh, so they can really see that one decimeter is composed of 10 of those centimeters. And the goal could be to keep moving around the circle until we have completed um, 10 cycles and earned 10 decimeters, and then they could trade those in for a full meter. So they're really feeling the quantity, that magnitude of that meter size or even that liter size. And again, that's just if students need um, some sort of uh, tangible piece to really understand what's happening um, as we're shifting between the, um, the units of a metric system. Here's an estimation activity. Um, this one is related, again, to the conversions between um, units. This one is another metric conversion activity. This one is not on the um, CCS resource guide, but there is a link to it if you click on grade es estimations. Uh, you will notice that when you click on this, it's actually a fourth grade uh, resource, but it's from DPI's AIG department, and um, it really is a really good resource for fifth grade as well. So what we did here is this is um, some teachers doing this activity with me, um, but I've done this activity with fourth and fifth grade students as well. Uh, we start off using um, boxes of spaghetti. Each group gets a box, and the students have to create a KW um, PL chart, I call it, because the P is um, writing a plan. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the kids have to create a KW PL chart. Uh, and the first part is looking at their box of spaghetti and writing down everything they know, every mathematical piece of information they know about that box of spaghetti. So serving size, weight, um, the, the length, for example. Once they've done that, then I tell them the W. I tell them what I want to know about it. So what I want to know is if we were to take all of these noodles from this box of spaghetti, line them up end to end, about how long, how many meters long would that be? 
So the students, before they can even open up their box of spaghetti, they have the K, they have the W, now they have to have the P, the plan. How could I make this estimate? How could I make the estimate without actually having to sit down and figure out exactly um, this length? How could I avoid trying to line these noodles up end to end? Uh, so then after they make their plan, they execute their plan, and then under the L, they write down what they've learned. Um, here, a couple ideas where teachers were figuring out the length of just one serving, and then they multiplied um, by the number of servings to figure out about the length, um, the approximate estimation. Uh, another teacher, was another group at the bottom left, they were trying to way um, they knew that the box weighed eight ounces there were eight ounces of spaghetti so they're trying to figure out the length of one ounce and then multiply that by eight so there's several different ways we can do this the neat thing about this is students end up having to make some conversions between centimeters to meters um, and they, they really get invested and they really all end up with close estimations this is just an example of what that kwpl chart looked like and if you want you could um, copy these slides your students. I'll just skim through these quickly. Here's another activity um, for measurement conversions. This one is for customary conversions, um, and it's from the CCS resource guide. It's from illustrativemathematics.org. This is a great re website because it has activities or tasks that are similar to our meaningful math tasks. Um, this one I addresses customary measurement, um, and I really like it because there's several different parts to it, and it builds in fractions as well. Uh, so the activity says that the Wesley walked 11 miles in four hours. Um, if he walked the same distance every hour, how far did he walk? But the students have to write their answers in three different ways. So um, A ends up being, um, a, there's a fractional amount in there because the students um, have to convert a little bit um, using fractions of miles. Uh, and then the second part is miles and feet, and then the third part is only feet. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of integrating fractions. I just wanted to touch on this a little bit more. As we do these measurement standards, it is absolutely essential to build in fractions. Um, if you're only teaching fractions in fifth grade at the time that it is allocated in isolation um, in the pacing or in the unit analysis, you are only teaching fractions for about 30% of the year. If you are embedding fractions into places where the EOG release test embedded them and into places where the unpacking um, document is suggesting we embed them, then you can teach fractions for over 60% of the year, which is huge because, again, we talk about how fractions is about 50% of the EOG. So let's talk about a couple suggestions for integrating fractions into the standard we just discussed. Um, here's an example. This is customary measurement. Um, and I'm going to let you read through these at your own pace. So let me just click through the end of this slide. Um, to pause the slide, just press the up arrow. And then when you're ready to continue on, you can press the down arrow. Here are a couple more ideas for integrating fractions. And again, those customary units are a great time for us to build those fractions in. Um, again, I'm going to show this, the problems. You can pause the slide by pressing the up arrow to read them. And then when you're ready to continue, you can press the down arrow. Here's one more um, resource I wanted to show. Uh, this resource, um, I posted because a lot of teachers ask, well, I really want to spend some time reviewing. Um, I don't have a lot of time to really dedicate to this unit, but I would like to spend some time doing maybe a warm-up in the morning or, or send some good homework home um, just for the kids as a quick review. So again, this resource isn't super rigorous and it's not a really good teaching resource, but it is some good extra practice for the students. Um, and that's Mr. Maffasoli's um, resources. Uh, so if you want to, you can take a minute to click on this or we can um, progress to the next slide. So the next standard that we're looking at is 5MD2. This is our line plot standard. Um, this standard asks students to create line plots after taking measurement data um, in fractions of a unit, like fractions of an inch, fractions of a foot. And then they would interpret the line plots and solve problems involving those line plots that they collected. 
Uh, one thing I really wanted to point out is that chances are when it comes to the EOG, not that the EOG is everything, but we want to think about how might this be assessed. Uh, when it comes to the EOG, chances are students will not be asked to make a line plot. They will be asked to interpret the data from a line plot. So we really want to spend a lot of time interpreting the data. So don't every day um, have students take measurement data and, and um, or measure to take data and then create line plots. You want to really take a line plot the students created and spend several days solving problems related to that line plot. Um, let's take a look at one activity that you could do this with. So this activity right here is a really great activity um, to collect some really good data and then use that data over a day or two um, and really engage in operating on fractions to analyze that data. Uh, so the activity is comparing the size of cell phones to pocket sizes and telling the students, you know, you really want to buy a cell phone um, and you need their help because you want to make sure that whatever cell phone you buy um, will fit into most of your pants pockets or your jacket pockets, any pocket that you might have, um, because that's how you carry your cell phone around. Um, usually when I start this activity, I start or start this lesson, I start by showing the students kind of the history of how cell phones have changed over time and how they've gotten smaller and smaller. Uh, just to kind of set the stage and get students engaged. And if you click on the link at the top of um, this slide, um, you can it'll take you to a lesson plan that has um, that information, those, those uh, um, pictures of how cell phones have changed over time. So then the first thing that you would do is talk about, now, if I want to make sure that my cell phone is going to fit in my pocket, what attribute are we going to be collecting data on here? Do we want to collect data on the height or the um, width or the, the weight? So um, the class will end up coming to the conclusion, well, let's collect data on the height to make sure it fits um, in your pocket. So then I would give students a whole bunch of data related to cell phones. And again, that data is going to be on this link um, if you click click the link at the top of your page. Um, I also put a copy of that data on the last slide of this presentation for you. Uh, so once we take all that data and we graph it or we um, organize it on the line plot, um, this might be what the blank line plot looks like, then we would say, okay, so now we know the most common length or height of a cell phone, um, but now we want to know what's the typical size of a pocket to make sure that our cell phones fit in there. So then the students will collect a whole bunch of data on their pocket sizes and organize that on a line plot. And now we have all this rich data to solve problems um, around. Um, in the next couple slides, I'm going to give you some ideas of the types of questions you can ask related to line plot data. So I wanted to start um, just by talking about some easy questions that students might see and that teachers kind of typically give when we're looking at line plots. Um, so the typical questions the teachers might start off asking are how many fruit, how many pieces of fruit did we weigh, um, or what was the most common weight, um, or how many pieces of fruit weighed more than half a pound. Um, but these questions don't really have us engaging with fractions the way that students need to be doing that that rigor that students need to be doing around line plots. And these questions are not typically the types of questions that will be asked in an EOG item. So let's talk about better questions that we could ask students as we work with line plots. So here's some more rigorous questions. If we put all the fruit in a bag, so all the pieces of fruit from this um, line plot, what would be the total weight? So now we're being forced, or we're, we're asking the students to add with unlike denominators. Um, here's another question. If Tony wanted to buy the five lightest pieces of fruit, how much would her bag weigh? And again, we're having to um, do some adding with unlike denominator. Um, here's a resource if you're looking for just examples of some line plots so that you can practice making some questions around them. Here's a resource of, again, Mr. Mathisoli. Uh, the, the activities he has are not super rigorous, but they are good examples of line plots that you can develop some of your own questions around. Uh, I just wanted to give you a couple more ideas for how we could integrate uh, fractions into the standard and how we could really focus on the different operations of fractions. Uh, one of the things that we really, really want to do when we do fractions with students is give them a problem, a word problem, and have them kind of figure out what operation they'll use. Because at the fifth grade level, 
students have already worked with fractions um, by doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And now this is a good time to apply all of that knowledge. I'm just going to um, click here and give you an, uh, some time to read through this, these sample questions. Um, so press the up arrow to pause, and when you're ready to continue, you can press the down arrow. Here's another example, and again, I'm just going to click through here, give you some time to read it, and when you're, um, so go up, press the up arrow to pause, and when you're ready, press the down arrow to continue. And again, one more example. Okay, so moving on, let's go ahead and talk about the remainder of third quarter measurement and data standards. Um, these standards are related to volume, and as we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, volume is a major work of um, fifth grade. So about half of the 10 to 15 percent of the fifth grade EOG items related to measurement and data will be on volume. MD3 focuses on just recognizing volume as an attribute, understanding what a unit cube is, and understanding that you can um, fill a solid figure with these unit cubes to figure out the volume. And then MD4 really focuses on um, how we are going to actually measure that volume. The last part of this standard, or the last part of this section, is MD5, and now this is um, solving problems related to volume, applying the formula um, for volume, and recognizing volume as additive. Uh, a couple things that you really want to focus on um, related to these three standards is the first thing that you really want to make sure that you're doing is recognizing that volume is an attribute of a solid figure. Um, recognize that a cube with a side length of one is one cubic unit of volume, and these could be um, used. These could be stacked with inside a um, a space to measure volume. And then recognize that a solid figure can be packed without gaps or overlaps um, using cubes. And then if you use n amount of cubes or a hundred or a thousand amount of cubes, then the volume is n or 100 or 1,000 cubic units. Uh, so once we understand that, we're also going to be measuring volume by counting these cubes. We're going to be relating volume to the operations of multiplication and addition, the same way that we related area to the repeated addition or multiplication. So now we're just adding that third dimension to it. Um, and then we're going to solve real-world problems related to volume. Okay, so there's a couple more things that we need to do related to volume. This, this is a really um, dense couple standards. There's a, a lot to do related to this. Uh, we're going to have students find the volume of re right rectangular prisms um, using whole numbered side lengths. So we're not going to engage with fractions here. So these are um, one set of stand standards that we would not be um, doing anything related to fractions. We're going to show that the volume is the same as it would be by multiplying the edge lengths. So we will practice packing a, a, a cube or a re rectangular prism. And then we could find the volume a second time by multiplying the edge lengths. And that's how we're going to actually introduce that formula for volume. When you introduce formulas, um, the sixth grade teachers have requested that you really make an effort to make sure that this students understand this is the formula that will only work with right rectangular prisms uh, because they're seeing that students are trying to apply this formula to any time we sell volume. Um, the last thing that you want to do related to this set of standards is recognize that volume is additive. So you can um, repeatedly add the layers to find that whole volume. Um, one example, or one thing I wanted to show you, was that if you only use the meaningful math tasks from this standard, you will have, or from this set of standards, you will have taught all of these things, all of these items that I just mentioned on the previous slides. Uh, so here you will notice, here's the first meaningful math task. If you teach this task using the teacher guide for the meaningful math task, you'll have taught all of the things that are in red on this slide. And what I just did was I took all of the bullets from the previous slide and I just item, um, listed them here. 
If you teach this second meaningful math task, you will have hit um, several more of the items or the bullets that we talked about previously. And then if you teach the last task, you will have ended up addressing um, every single one of the items that we need to address in this unit. So even if you're only just using those three meaningful math tasks, um, you will have addressed everything that you need to for this unit. One thing I really want to point out about the meaningful math tasks is they are not meant to be just an introduction to class. Uh, they are meant to be used throughout the entire lesson. So what you would do is you would introduce the meaningful math task, have students grapple with it, have students do a math talk and then pick some of the teaching points or one or two of the teaching points from the teacher's guide to teach the remainder of that lesson. So everything is related then around that meaningful math task. I wanted to end today by just um, showing you one example of a released EOG item um, related to the volume standards. Um, this item says that um, here's a figure, uh, and it just wants you to find the volume of the figure. So it's pretty much straightforward, and it gets at that idea that you can find um, that volume is additive. You can find the volume of one part, and then the volume of the other part, and then add the two parts together. Um, that's all we have today for this session. I appreciate your time following through the whole session. I know this was a long one, uh, and have a great day. Thank you.